So let's, let's dive in. And uh, before there was ever a movie, there was a book, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. It's a children's book, you may remember this, written by Dr. Seuss in 1957. Imagine that. And the book has since been made into a number of things, an animated television special featuring the voice of Boris Karloff in 1966. In 2018, Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, or however you say his last name, I'm not certain, uh, did an animated, computer-generated animated film on The Grinch. And back in 2000, can you believe time flies like this? Jim Carrey, Ron Howard, Ron Howard of Opie, Andy Griffith fame, got together and created this amazing film that's been around for 20 years, How the Grinch Saved Christmas. Let, let me give you just a side note. In 2000, Jen and I were living in South Florida, Palm Beach Gardens, uh, Florida, and it's about two and a half hours south of Orlando. And my parents decided that year that they were gonna do Thanksgiving in Orlando. They were driving down to meet us. We would drive up to meet them. And because my parents really, really like to save money, they, they bought a timeshare and they fit about 20 of us into this three bedroom timeshare. I remember this so vividly, camping out on the floor along with like 20 kids. At this point, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm older than this. Why do I have to be here? But we went to Disney World together, so it was a fun memory. But that week, my mother was such a big, big Christmas movie fan. That week in Orlando, we had to go see this film, and my mother was absolutely blown away by this movie. And, and by the way, if, if you think, you can take it down for just a second before we get to that part. If you think about this movie, uh, Jim Carrey actually had to go through eight and a half hours of makeup every day to play this role. And to prepare for this role, Ron Howard actually sent Jim Carrey to a torture endurance training, this is not made up, by the CEA to prepare for this. And Jim Carrey said every day that he had to put on the makeup was actually like being buried alive. The first day he did it, he walked into that dressing trailer, kicked a hole in the wall, told Ron Howard, I'm done, I'm out of here, I can't take it somehow he managed to get through it and we're left with something that our family doesn't just watch once a year but when my girls were small Cameron was born the year this came out when my girls were small we probably watched this movie several times each and every year so let me give you the gist of the film the book and the movies take on the crass commercialism of Christmas and they challenge us to rediscover the beauty of simplicity and the joy of generosity. In Ron Howard's film, everyone in Whoville loves Christmas, everybody except the Grinch. We learn that the backstory of the Grinch's hatred of Christmas stems from growing up, feeling like an outcast, and things reach a breaking point when the Grinch is bullied and humiliated in front of the love of his life, Martha May Huvier. The Grinch loses his temper, flies into a rage, and declares, I hate Christmas. And at this point, something happens to the Grinch's heart. It's broken, it's damaged. And the Grinch makes the same decision that a lot of people make who get wounded, broken, and damaged in interpersonal relationships. He reaches this conclusion. It's safer not to care, not to feel, not to love. And according to to the book for the next 53 years, he doesn't. In the book, he moves to the top of Mount Crumpet, north of Whoville, where he lives in isolation, and now you can bring up that picture, with his loyal dog, Max. And the Grinch is easily frustrated, easily annoyed, easily angered. He becomes really, really bitter. The sounds of laughter, music, joy irritate him, and something inside him wants to hurt everybody else the way he has been hurt. Eventually, the Grinch concocts this plan, a plan to crush the Christmas spirit and celebration of the Who's in Whoville by disguising himself as Santa Claus 
and stealing their entire Christmas. Now, when the Who's wake up and discover Christmas presents are gone, at first they are devastated. In fact, the town's mayor, uh, Mayor Augustus Mayhu, even blames Cindy Lou Who, a little girl, for the whole fiasco. But in a moment of courage, Cindy's dad steps up to the plate and says to Mayor Mayhu, this is what my daughter's been trying to teach us, teach me for weeks. Christmas isn't about gifts. It's not about fancy lights. It's actually about love, family, friends, kindness, generosity. He ends his speech by saying this, I don't need anything more for Christmas than this right here, my family. Merry Christmas, everybody. And all of a sudden, you see it in the film. It's movie magic. The, the, the Who's have an epiphany, and they break into spontaneous song. They begin to sing the Whoville Christmas Carol, which I will not try to do for you because I really don't understand the words. It's something like, fa who fa raz da dude. It's, it's, it's crazy. And then the narration cuts to the Grinch on top of Mount Crumpet about to destroy the Christmas of the Who's. Something happens. And then you remember the narration, right? It's done in the original television special by the amazing Boris Karloff in the 2000 Ron Howard film. It's done by Sir Anthony Hopkins. And I mean, it's like this guy could read the phone book and you would say, oh wow, that was amazing. But he begins, he begins the narration. Then the Grinch heard a sound a sound rising over the snow. It started in low, it started to grow, but the sound wasn't sad, why this sounded merry. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small was singing without any presence at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came somehow or other, it came just the same. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet, ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. He puzzled and puzzled till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say that the Grinch's heart grew two sizes or three sizes that day. Anybody remember that? And all of a sudden, there's this transformation. It's amazing movie magic. Here's what I want to do. I want to ask you this question and attempt to answer it through a, through a Bible story this morning. The question that's asked in that movie, is your heart two sizes too small? I want to talk about our tendency, our proneness towards selfishness and the gift God has given us in generosity. Now, I did my best, best Dr. Seuss imitation with a big idea. It'll come up on the screen. It's there in your notes, but I want us to say it out loud. How many times we say it depends on what? How well and loud you say it. So let's say it out loud. You ready? We'll begin with selfishness. Selfishness makes us small. Generosity makes us grow. Both come from the heart what we choose and what we know. Oh, that was good. You just aced it, but we're going to do it again because you did it so well. Are you ready? Selfishness makes us small. Generosity makes us grow. Both come from the heart, what we choose and what we know. Now, I want you to think about the implications of that. Because while it's Dr. Seuss-esque, and by the way, I hope everyone realizes that Dr. Seuss was an absolute genius. In fact, that book has received several, several awards even since Dr. Seuss's passing. And the book itself is like number 12 Number 12 on the best picture books of all time. Teachers, teachers talk about the amazing perception of that book. And this statement is also loaded. This statement comes out of a passage in 2 second, second Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, chapter number 9, where Paul is writing the first century equivalent of a fundraising 
a fundraising letter. He's writing to a group of people who struggle with the same thing that we still struggle with in 2019. They struggle with generosity. And Paul applauds them for several things. In fact, look in your notes at the passage I gave you. It will not come up on the screen, but it is in your notes. You do well, he says, and excel in every respect. And then he lists how they excel. He says, you excel in unstoppable faith, powerful preaching, revelation knowledge, passionate devotion, in sharing your love. What a lineup. I mean, think about this. Paul is commending them and saying, your faith is unstoppable. You preach in a powerful way. You have incredible knowledge of God's word. Your devotion is passionate. You share your love selflessly, but make sure, end of the verse, that you also excel. Notice, I love the passion translation here because it expands on the richness of the original text. Make sure that you excel, you see it in your notes, in grace-filled generosity. And the question becomes, why? Why do we need to be people who excel in generosity? Paul wants to make certain we, we understand the why behind the what. So he tells us in verse 9, here's the motivation. Here's the reason you should be generous. Here's the catalyst that'll fire you up and motivate your generosity. It's in your notes. It'll also come up on the screen. Just read it out loud with me because this is one of the most amazing verses in the New Testament. If you practice committing verses to memory, you want to commit this one to memory. Just say it out loud. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. Do you see that? This is an amazing passage of Scripture. Paul is writing to this group of people, and he says the reason we can be generous is because God has been so generous. In fact, God hasn't just been generous. God has been extravagantly generous. The grace and generosity of God inspires and motivates your generosity. You know the generous grace of Jesus. He actually left the glory that he had with the Father before the world even began. I mean, he was decked out in splendor and majesty and glory. And he willingly, willingly submitted himself to servanthood, willingly became an embryo in the womb of a teenage mother, willingly traveled the birth canal and was born in a Bethlehem barn, willingly was raised in abject poverty, willingly grew up as a carpenter's son, willingly lived a selfless, sinless life. He did all of that. He was rich, but for your sake, he became poor so that through his poverty, he could do what? Does anybody see it? Make you what? Rich, what what does he mean, rich? He's not giving us a prosperity gospel. He's saying Jesus Christ took upon our sin. He took upon himself our suffering. He took upon himself our slavery. And he did it for this purpose. So he could make us wealthy with healing and wholeness, salvation and freedom. He gave us all of that. So Paul ends, you can take that down. This one's in your notes. I don't know if it's, yes, it's, it'll come up on the screen. He ends the whole fundraising part of this letter, 2 Corinthians 9, 15, with this. Let's just say this one out loud. It reads in a variety of different ways according to the translation, but I love it in the voice translation. Praise God for this incredible, unbelievable, indescribable gift. Here's what Paul is saying. You can't look at the extravagant generosity of God and say you follow that God and not become generous yourself. And if there's a part of you that leans into selfishness, and there's a part of all of us that will do that from time to time, 
That part of us needs to be brought under the lordship of Christ. We need to remember the extravagant generosity of God because his extravagant generosity says to us, this is the only way to live. Now let me do something in like 18 minutes, which would be a miracle. Maybe they still happen. I, I want to give you a Bible story about a woman who lived this kind of extravagant generosity. And her story is found in John chapter 12. It is one of my favorite stories. Favorite stories in all the New Testament. Her motivation for it. Being generous was the same motivation Paul covered in 2 Corinthians 8, 2 Corinthians 9. John 12 occurs on the heels of John 11. Anybody remember what astounding miracle takes place in John 11? It's the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And you would think that John 11 would end in this amazing party. I mean, where everybody gathers at at Lazarus, Mary, and Martha's house, they turn up the bass. Somebody starts the music, and they party. But chapter 11 doesn't end that way. Anybody remember how it ends? It ends with the religious authorities gathering together, angered by what has happened, and they actually sign Jesus' death warrant. But in John 12, there's this small group of people who've been so wrecked by the extravagant generosity of God that they say, we can't experience that kind of miracle and not have a thank you party for Jesus. We gotta make sure we let him know how we feel about what just happened. So look at John chapter 12, verses one through about verse two. It's in your notes, six days before the Passover. Celebration began. Jesus arrived in Bethany where Lazarus lived. The man wants to make certain we're clear. Jesus had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. And I love the description here. Martha served. Lazarus was among those who ate with Jesus. This was a thank you party. Lazarus was the brother of Martha and Mary. Lazarus had been dead. Now he was alive. And everybody converges Upon the house of Lazarus, Mary, Martha, Martha to celebrate, Jesus was the guest of honor. It's interesting that the people at the party express their gratitude to Jesus in a few different ways. Do you see it in those two verses? Martha, Lazarus' sister, was expressing her gratitude by organizing and serving the meal. She was that kind of girl. She had those kinds of gifts. She knew how to cook, so she gets busy in the kitchen. And look at Lazarus. What was Lazarus doing? The same thing the majority of men in this room were doing on Thanksgiving. He sat at the table and ate. He doesn't offer Martha a helping hand. He just obliges to eat the food. It's almost like you're reading the text and it's like Lazarus is saying, Hey, I already did the hard work, man. I was dead. Can a dude just sit here when he's alive and eat? And then what's Mary doing? I believe Mary had been preparing for what's about to go down since Lazarus, Martha, and Mary came up with the idea. Let's have a thank you party for Jesus. And I think Mary may have thought to herself, wow, Lazarus, he has his story to share. That's the way he can glorify Jesus. Martha, my sister, the girl can cook. She can use those gifts to glorify Jesus. What about me? What can I do to let Jesus know how I feel about what he did for my brother, what he did for our family, what he did for me? And she gets this idea. At first, it seems absurd. Maybe even borders on a outrageous. She's never seen it done before. She has no idea where the, where the idea came from. But she thinks about her most valuable possession, her most treasured object. She wants Jesus to know he trumps everything. She wants Jesus to know she values him above it all. She decides he's worth it. He, he's worth everything. I'm going for broke. Check out verse 3, one of the most amazing verses in all the Bible. It's on the screen. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, 
and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. And don't miss the last sentence, it's beautiful. The house was filled with the fragrance. Just leave that text there for a moment, Jenny. This likely represented Mary's life savings. Uh, verse 5 lets us know it was worth a year's wages. In that era, an ordinary worker worked six days a week, 12 hours a day. If we put it in the equivalency of the day's economy for a person in Birmingham, a year's wages is about $33,700 in Birmingham. Think about how long it takes an ordinary worker to amass $33,700 in savings. Think about it, 312 days of work, an entire life savings, maybe the family inheritance, all of her financial security as a single woman in the first century, maybe her entire net worth. Think about what she could have bought with this. Think about the security this could have provided. But all Mary can think about is this. My brother was dead. But Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Hallelujah. I've got him back. He not only raised my brother, he raised me. He changed me. He revolutionized me. There's no way I can measure his worth. There's no way I can calculate the depth of my love. There's no way I can put a price tag on my affection for Jesus. I'll give him this much. I'll give him more. He's been extravagantly generous with me. So I'm going to be extravagantly generous with him. Maybe Mary knows inwardly, this perfume is too good for me, but it's not too good for him. So she takes all $33,700 worth and pours it on Jesus' feet. Notice that. If you mark in your notes, you might just want to underline that. She anointed Jesus' feet. Why does it focus on the feet? Because in the first century, caring for the feet was the job of a servant. It was the job of a slave. And Mary's saying out loud, that's who I am from this point forward. I'm your servant. And notice what she does. She wipes his feet with what? Her hair. This is amazing. In the first century, a woman would only let down her hair in the presence of her husband. This was a symbol, first of all, of intimacy. This is the love I feel for my master, my lord, and my king. And it's also an indication of her humility. I'll take what is most precious and beautiful about me, and I'll make it a rag to wipe your feet after all you've done for me. Notice one more thing before I fill in the points. Her extravagant worship not only affected her, but you see the last sentence, would you say this out loud? The house was filled with the fragrance. There's something you need to know about extravagant worship. I'm talking about worship that comes from the depth of who you are, the depth of someone who realizes what Jesus has done and then is poured out upon Jesus. Extravagant worship not only affects you, extravagant worship changes the atmosphere. All of a sudden, the people in the room smell something different, something beautiful. I think her, her heart grew three sizes that day. But there's a spectator in the room watching this all go down. And the spectator, the spectator gives us a picture of a heart that has shrunk. It's Judas. Check out verse number four. He watches everything that goes down in that house. And the scripture says this, but Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. 
And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Judas is the picture of the guy whose heart is two sizes too small. And unfortunately, his heart never got any bigger. It never grew. You, you need to know something about generosity. We are not born generous. We are born selfish. We are all born with a heart two sizes too small. I mean, one word that you never have to teach a child. Thank you, Derek. Everybody say that out loud. Mine. I love Thanksgiving because we got to spend so much time with our family and Jack. <laughs> he's, he's sort of the star of the show right now. And even at two and a half years old, he knows this, this is mine. And the height of a compliment from Jack is when he shares something with you. The other day, he brought me a piece of bubble gum. I thought I'd won the lottery. That's extravagant generosity for a two and a half year old. Here's a question we need to ask ourselves regularly. Am I being generous or am I being selfish? Am I becoming more generous or am I becoming more selfish? Both extremes exist in this story. Mary is this amazing picture of extravagant generosity. And Judas is this picture of extreme selfishness. Mary has this heart that grows three sizes, four, five. That single day she kneeled at Jesus' feet. And Judas is the picture of this guy whose heart shrivels and shrivels and shrivels. Now, we can't imagine anybody having the nerve to steal from Jesus, right? And that's what, Jesus, that's what Judas did. And yet the Bible also tells us in Malachi chapter 3 of a group of people that God says, you're robbing me, and they protest. What do you mean we're robbing you by withholding my tithe and your offering? You're robbing me. Judas was this guy, when you trace his history, who lived by this motto, what's in it for me? And the moment he came to this realization that Jesus wasn't going to fulfill his plans for his life, he decided to ditch Jesus, go his own way. His heart shriveled. And I want to say to you, selfishness will be your enemy until the day you die. There will always be this propensity to hold on, to grab to hold. But look at the big idea, and then let me fill in your blanks. Let's say it out loud. Selfishness makes us small. Generosity makes us grow. Both come from the heart, what we choose and what we know. So let me fill in those blanks really, really quick. Record time. You ready? Here's the first. Gratitude and praise are always the right response to grace. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Get this. Thankfulness and gratitude always flow out of a vision that sees life as a gift. This, this Thanksgiving was a little difficult for me. This birthday was a little difficult for me. I had a birthday Wednesday, by the way. I just turned 40. Thank you very much. <laughs> and when you're faced with a year filled with difficulty, you have a choice to make. Am I going to focus? Am I going to focus on what I have lost? Or will I look around the table and focus on all that God has given me? Amen. Gratitude and thankfulness flow out of a vision that sees life as a gift. And the only alternative to a life of gratitude is to grow a heart like the Grinch's that is chronically discontent, selfish, complaining, judgmental, dissatisfied. I want to ask you this morning, what do you have to be thankful for? I know that you might have experienced pain this year. 
I know that you might look back and a lot of this year have been really, really difficult. But what do you have to be thankful for? And can you take that and recognize and realize that, that it is a gift? Can, can I give you just a cool story? I hadn't even planned to share this, but I want to give gratitude to God. In the last few days of my mother's life, I'm talking about just two days maybe before she passed, and a day or so before she drifted into that sleep that came before her death. She gathered the family, and I, I have a brother who has been running from God for several years. And my mother started giving challenges to all of my brothers, and she really appealed to this brother about his relationship with Jesus. The night I officiated at my mother's memorial, my brother's wife, I felt a leading to give an actual altar appeal, and my, mother, my brother's wife responded and surrendered her life to Jesus. So, Awesome, awesome miracle for our family. But then, we'll, we'll clap in just a minute. Thank you, though. A week before Christmas, my brother Kelly, who will be speaking here at Revive, and you don't want to miss him. He always keeps me on the edge of my seat. Zion's dad. You never know what Kelly's going to say. It's always fun and interesting. A week before Thanksgiving, my brother called me one night and he kept calling me. I, I couldn't get to my phone. I left it in another room, but my watch kept telling me that my brother was calling. So he called like two or three times. And I'm thinking, what, what, oh goodness, it, it must be an emergency. Something bad must have occurred. So I run, grab my phone, call my brother. He said, hey dude, guess where I just left? And I'm like, I, I have no idea where you just left. I mean, where did you just left? He said, I just left Stephen and Angela's house. They called me and asked me to come over and pray with them because Stephen wanted to give his heart to Jesus Christ and they wanted to dedicate their family to Jesus. That is the miracle of... See, we can look around ourselves and we can point out all of our losses or we can look at our victories and breakthroughs and the goodness of God and see life as a gift and say for this, I will choose to be thankful. I'll choose to be grateful. Now let's clap our hands loudly to God. I'm going to fill in the blanks. Worship and generosity flow from a heart overwhelmed by God's grace and mercy. I'll fill in the other blanks about givers online. Three, generosity keeps me free from my biggest challenge, which happens to be me. This, this is really cool. We're, we're approaching the end of the year, so we look at our finances do you know why Jan and I are committed to giving a tithe of everything that God flows into our life? Because I know the waywardness of my heart. And every time we give a tithe, it reminds me that God is boss and I am not. Generosity, generosity keeps me free from my biggest challenge which happens to be me and for when generosity becomes our focus god pays attention and always takes notice now go back through those four points when you get home and i did my best to come up with dr seuss like rhymes for those points if i erred give me grace but let me focus on this when generosity becomes our focus god always always sees takes notice uh, four days later there's going to be evidently another woman because Mark's gospel Matthew's gospel says it happens two days before the Passover 
We believe the text is inspired. So Mary dedicates, anoints six days. Another woman dedicates, anoints two days before Passover. And, and the other woman pours oil on Jesus' head. And the disciples rise up and they rebuke this woman for, again, what they assume is extravagant waste. And Jesus says, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't you criticize her. You're going to have the poor always. You won't have me always. And by the way, what she's done is so important that wherever the gospel is preached she's going to be remembered can i tell you something about mary and the unnamed woman in mark and in matthew's gospel i don't think either of them worshiped to get famous i think they worshiped because they wanted to give their heart to god but god said when you honor me i honor you oh can i give you this i just ran across it the other day do you know in the old testament people would always build memorials to the faithfulness of god Israel crosses, Israel crosses the Red Sea. Moses says, hey, wait right there. And some people go back in. They take stones, put them in the water. They celebrate God's goodness. They want a monument to God's faithfulness. And this takes place throughout Israel's history. But according to Acts chapter 10, there's a dude named Cornelius. He was a Roman soldier. And for years, he had given to the poor. For years, he had prayed. He didn't have a relationship with God. But something was drawing him to God. And one day, an angel shows up. Up and the angel says to Cornelius, Cornelius, you need to know this. Your prayers and your generosity has come up before God and created a memorial. We build memorials to the faithfulness of God, but oh, I want this to fire you up when we are generous somewhere in heaven. God says, hmm, I'm going to build a memorial to them. I just want to remember their generosity. I want it to always be before me. And because they've been generous, I'm going to go into action. I'll even send an angel if necessary to break through and come through on their behalf. That's good news, right?